12 and 5, 4, 9, 12, 3, 2, 7. And we're here. Welcome, friends. After a million, million, million technical difficulties, we decided to go from the Facebook to the YouTubes, and uh, we are now working. We are in full force with Dr. Janine Krippner, all the way from Silver Spring, Maryland, by way of Te Alamutu, New Zealand. How are you, my friends? I'm good, thank you. I mean, I don't think we're doing this pandemic right if we don't have major technological issues every day, right? So we're doing Facts. fine. Facts. What a crazy, crazy evening. <laughs> thank you for your patience. <laughs> My pleasure. How's everything going? Good, good. Getting, getting a lot of work done. Luckily, I can work fully from home and, you know, my way of coping with things seems to be get a million more things to do. So I'm keeping myself busy. How about you? Crazy. Um, same thing, you know, able to work from home, um, or, you know, doing as much as I can with, you know, the limited technical reset resources that I have at the moment, because obviously I'm a musician, not a technician. <laughs> <laughs> Normally in, in an ideal world, we can, um, you know, we can have a look at, uh, you know, I can I can reach out for people to help with things like live streaming to YouTube and things. In fact, we didn't even need to do the, these things back, you know, a month ago because we could do these things in, in real life. Yeah. Um, but here we are doing our thing, <laughs> learning lots and uh, trying to stay hydrated while we do <laughs> Yes. So tell for those of you, who, for those out there who don't know what you do and who you are, can you give us an overview of who is Dr. Janine Krippner? Right, so I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a doctor of volcanoes. So just like testing out a patient to understand what's going on, to understand what's going on in volcanoes in order that to, to help people around volcanoes, we have to understand every single aspect of volcanoes around the world and how to communicate what is wrong so that we can help people. So I'm what we call a physical volcanologist or a geologist. Um, I look at volcanic rocks. In fact, I, I always have a volcanic rock nearby. This is one from the Mount St. Helens 1980 eruption. Um, and my journey, I started out in New Zealand. I did my um, bachelor's and master's. I studied Mount Doom from Lord of the Rings or another Hawaii volcano. Oh my gosh. And pretty cool, huh? I'm from near here, Hobbiton too. So I made the journey. <laughs> my first time skydiving was over Hobbiton. Ah, nice. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I came to the States after living in Australia for three years. I got some professional experience there and I did my PhD looking at explosive volcanic eruption types using satellites and heading into the field into some pretty extreme environments like very remote northern Kamchatka. And mm -hmm. now I'm here. I'm with the Smithsonian Institution Global Volcanism Program. So we are kind of record keepers of eruptions around the world. So we're looking at all the information that comes out about volcanic activity and compiling it in a way so that it's all documented, as well as improving um, what people have access to, good information about volcanoes online. Mm -hmm. And on top of all of that, that's my job, um, I also do a lot of communication. So for very broad audiences, when there's a crisis or a volcano in, in the news, I'll do media interviews with agencies around the world. Um, I try to get good, trustworthy information out there because um, a lot of these events make people quite scared for good reason um, and gives a lot of anxiety. So I try to get the good information out there. Sometimes people need that to make decisions. Um, and since this pandemic began, I started a YouTube uh, series of videos. Actually, it started up in Twitter and now they've got bigger and longer. Uh, looking at every aspect of volcanology um, and volcano research or yeah. experiences with eruptions. So inter um, interviewing people around the world to try and get short snippets of understandable volcano knowledge out there for everyone. That's awesome. So are you, um, okay, so I have so many questions. <laughs> One, <laughs> you've seen some shit, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've I've been on a journey, like the hobbits to Mount to Mount Doom. I've I've been there and not quite back again. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I left New Zealand uh, 10 and a half years ago and it's it's been hard. It's been hard in ways I never could have imagined. Um, it's really been a process of breaking myself down, not in a, you know, not in a nervous breakdown quite a way, but mm-hmm. um, really wearing myself down in ways I didn't know that I could and building myself back up. But, you know, part of that is keeping in mind what are my goals? Um, my goals are I want to help people. I want to help people using communication in ways that I didn't know were available when I started. Mm -hmm. And I want to be working on volcanoes and trying to uplift people and make people's lives a little better with their their little smiles throughout the day where I can. So there's a massive line. I feel like there's a massive disconnect between, I don't know, at least when you're not from New Zealand, like we are, um, I feel like a lot of people in the Western world have a massive disconnect between people or humanity and the earth you know we don't think about like a way of, th- of helping people is through science or through natural science or physical science as you said so like how what was it about um what was it about volcanoes that was like this is the thing that I'm going to help people with um, it actually came the other way around. Um, I fell in love with volcanoes first. I mean, right. my mum loves to remind me I've always wanted to help people since I was, I was little. Um, but I just, I always loved volcanoes. I don't remember not loving volcanoes. Um, it was just something I was innately fascinated with. And I remember going down to the Tongariro Volcanoes, um, Arupehu, which, and, and which has Narahoe on it, uh, Mount Doom in the central North Island of New Zealand. And I remember just staring up at Narrahoe and we're driving around these winding roads, um, a desert road. And I'm like craning my neck, trying to just see it. I'm in love with this volcano. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking the exact words, like this is way too cool to be a real job. I'm from like a farming town in New Zealand, a beautiful, wonderful farming town that I love and adore. But I, right. I didn't know any scientists. I didn't know volcanology was a thing. Um, and when I was 13 years old, sitting in the back of geography class, teacher writes volcanologist on the board and writes what that is. You know, it's the scientist that studies volcanoes and I'm leaning forward and I sit back, I'm like, oh my God, that's what I am. Like that was it, 13 years old. You were 13 when you decided to be a volcanologist? No, I was 13 when I knew I was a volcanologist. Oh, nice. (laughs) Yeah, 13 years old. Um, And now two decades later, I'm doing that, just that. the ways of helping people has changed. You know, I clearly didn't see social media coming Mm -hmm. (laughs) all the way back then, but um, with volcanoes, uh, they kill people. They hurt people and they destroy lives in many different ways. And knowledge is really power, knowing what the volcano can do. And that takes a huge amount of very technical um, science with instruments, technology and expertise and experience from global volcanologists. And right. so understanding what the volcano has done in the past, understanding the, the rocks or the geology, what they can tell us about the magma, how the magma moved as it was erupting or leading to that eruption, um, understanding what's happening as magma is moving to the surface, it gives us clues and hints that if using all the best science we have, we can determine my, maybe what it's going to do, like the weather, we can give a forecast of what right. the eruption might look like. And then by understanding um, all of those processes and the local... Um, environment or the shape of the land and what that particular volcano might do we can tell people to get out of the way in time and that saves a lot of lives that's yeah I can't even begin to like imagine the stress that you (laughs) must experience on a a regular basis because there's you know coming from New Zealand there's so many active volcanoes but there's active volcanoes all over the world right so yeah they're around 43 or something at the moment which is just a casual 43 (laughs) we live on a very active planet um with there are a lot of really great things that come from volcanoes like soils or water or atmosphere or different environments and the ecosystems that come with that Uh, yeah so there are a lot of amazingly positive things about volcanoes too and um, but they they can be incredibly destructive we don't stand a chance against them and we need to get out of the way while they do their thing and then back to our lives of course so like you you touched on the whole thing of um you know they're everywhere they're dangerous they're scary but 
I feel like having known you for 13 years, we've had, a, you know, just a couple of conversations about um, how there's a huge, there's a lot of misinformation around volcanoes. There's a lot of misinformation around fear when it comes to volcanoes. There's a lot of misinformation about science when it comes to volcanoes yeah. uh, or when it comes to like life in general. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of just, yeah, misinformation. Yeah, and some of it is intentional. I see that a lot. Um, there are certain tabloids out there that it's unbelievable how people can make stuff up for profit. Um, I wouldn't, I would have thought, you know, people would sound paranoid saying that, but I've seen it over and over and over again. Wow. Uh, where there's, there's bad information being put out there for, you know, clicks and likes. And it can be really scary. You know, Yellowstone has become this massive boogeyman in the closet for no good reason other than it gets a lot of attention. Right. Um, Why is so that? So helping people, um, it's, I'm sorry, it's really loud. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, there have been a few movies that have come out that have featured Yellowstone and it's kind of taken off. It's really, it's that simple, like it has produced a few extremely large eruptions, a couple, like two or three, mm -hmm. um, but other volcanoes have too, and this is just one that has become mythological in a way, and it's it's a very easy, you know, if someone has a headline that says, you know, Yellowstone's going to blow, which is never true, well, made to make profit off people's fear, and I, I can't stand it. Um, I can't stand seeing people afraid of something when they don't need to be, especially during a pandemic. This happened only a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, it, volcanoes are incredible and fascinating and people generally want to learn about them and, and people don't deserve to be frightened by them when there's no need to be. Sometimes there is and other times they're okay. They're just doing their thing. Everything's yeah. fine. Do you, so you, you mentioned um, specifically around the pandemic at the moment. So obviously with coronavirus being a thing, um, they were all having to deal with. Um, how, like, has that, has misin has there been a lot of misinformation around volcanoes that has kind of superseded, like, or been influenced by coronavirus, or is there? Yeah, so there's, there's been a couple of um, things that have happened, one being Yellowstone. I mean, Yellowstone has the headlines every couple of months, it seems. Um, but there were a few earthquakes in neighboring states, so still like 400 miles at least away from Yellowstone. Um, so one of those people started saying there was an earthquake in Yellowstone and it was an, um, a sign of an impending eruption. We're like, it has nothing to do with this volcano. Um, there was something a couple of weeks before that um, about Yellowstone where the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory had released public information in a way that anyone could read it, but it went through this kind of game of telephone in Chinese words. That's a horrible term. The game of telephone um, where it turned into this unrecognizable thing, something completely different. And then, you know, people are saying, why aren't the volcanologists telling us what they, well, what's going on like this? originated from actual material and actual information, but it turned into this cascading mm -hmm. monster. Um, and then there was this uh, moderate, maybe smaller style, sized eruption at Krakatau, um, I'm not Krakatau, or Krakatoa, as many people misunderstand the name. And um, that was actually like one of Where the most that? original. Uh, that's in uh, Indonesia. It okay. produced a catastrophic eruption in 1883, which um, influenced climate and was devastating and produced it just like this volcano kind of the eruption was so enormous it destroyed most of itself and this volcano has been sitting there chilling just erupting over like decades just doing its thing and um, just over two years ago there was a massive collapse and it, it fell into the ocean and it caused a tsunami that killed several hundred people um, so which was horrific and heartbreaking to see and uh, it happened to have like a moderate small moderate sized eruption very short-lived didn't last very long up, um, last weekend and of course that hit social media and people were showing eruptions of before the cone collapsed so it looked completely different and mm -hmm. saying that it was this enormous eruption and all this drama and I, I woke up I was like 
no what <laughs> no <laughs> when you said when you said like a small eruption because because volcanoes are millions of years old so millions of years hundred thousand of years they can i mean be. okay um, yeah so when you say like it was a short eruption what does that mean i mean like minutes oh minutes, okay literally minutes to yeah minutes to like human minutes human short size human okay yeah, human <laughs> um yeah it's it was, it was pretty small. It was like a little a burp, a volcanic burp, um, and it was fine. When I went, like it happened hours before I went to bed, and I posted it, and everything was fine, and no one cared. And then by the next morning, <laughs> and this is what happens, and it happens over and over again. And people often share the wrong videos of a larger or a completely different eruption. And it, um, social media influences with like hundreds of thousands or millions of followers share this misinformation without checking it and of course you know i only have like i don't know twenty four thousand ish followers on twitter you know that's how i get my information out and when someone with like 2.4 followers on twitter tweets like oh not now yellowstone jokingly the damage is done yeah you know, that's so many more people that i can then i and other volcanologists as well it's not just me and um, yeah. we can keep up with right so here, here's a curveball that you may not want to answer. I don't know. I'm, I'm ready. Given how much you see when it comes to people of influence, comes to the news, comes to whatever, um, delivering about Yellowstone or Karakao, is that how you pronounce it? Karakao. Krakakoa, sorry. Oh, sorry, Krakatoa. Um, Krakatoa. Oh, okay. okay. So I did have the last, the last syllable day. right. Cool. <laughs> Krakakoa. Um, okay. So, given the amount of misinformation around things like eruptions, um, how do you feel people are handling COVID? <laughs> it's been really fascinating. Like, I'll just, I'll tackle one part of it. You know, there's a lot of horrible, horrible, heartbreaking stuff out there, but it's been fascinating in a way, like trying to remove myself from it and see what can I learn? How can I learn about how to communicate better? Um, mm -hmm. How can I apply these lessons to world technology? Um, you know, it's a similar thing of someone will say something off the cuff on the news or someone will say, you know, this, medicine or this technique or this food or this thing will will prevent um you getting it or will make the symptoms less and and then it just goes viral and there's no amount of catching up that people can make to you know counteract that um words can cause so much damage mm. and a lack of compassion for other people is you know, is causing a lot of damage as well. And it's the same, like not thinking, what can me sharing this information or saying this thing, how can this impact people other than myself? Yeah. And that's that's a big similarity. It's just the amount of misinformation that goes viral and, you know, yeah. it's, it can be flashier and more sensational than the reality, even when the reality is already horrifying. You know, people have got to have something else to get those likes and those retweets or those shares or, you know, whatever it is. It's, I don't know, I, I, I don't understand it. It's astounding. I, I I know that you don't spend much time on Facebook these days, but um, Twitter is like your main jam. Um, but, you know, the amount of messages that like those forwarded messages that I get from people of like, all you need to do is gargle salt and lemon water three times a day and you'll be fine. Or, you know, heat kills viruses. So make sure that you're in well, <laughs> well, warm, you know, environments all the time to ensure and, you know, insert other thing here. Insert, you know, this was some crock pot illness that was concocted in some Chinese laboratory to kill everybody because... <laughs> It's, it's like it's amazing how many people have spread hate and spread just absolute crap in terms of like this is how you can heal yourself with positive thoughts and a little dash of cumin <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i'm all for spices and positive thinking don't get me wrong but um, anyway. 
No, it's, you know, I know a lot of it is, a lot of it is coming from, you know, a good intention. A lot of people are really trying to share the good information and I can see how confusing it can be, especially in the early days of this pandemic. Um, how how confusing it was to find the right information. Um, you know, I, I was paying very close attention to my own responses, you know, being someone in a hazard or a disasters field where I know that, you know, the bad case, the worst case scenario, that bad thing, it can happen to me. You know, it's something we all fall into um, as humans thinking that'll never happen to me. Um, but I know that's not the case. And so I, I actually started uh, social distancing seven weeks ago today, I think. Today's Monday? I don't know what day it is. Today's Monday. All day. Because, <laughs> um, you know, I saw, I was watching the scientists on social media. I was seeing what was happening in other countries. Knowing my own situation, you know, I am higher risk with health. Um, I, I don't have paid sick leave and I, I don't have a lot of faith in my health insurance. So mm. I was like, I can't take mass public transport and go to work in a busy place. I'm going to start working from home until I understand what's going on. Um, yeah. So, yeah, knowing where to get the right information is, is really difficult. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't blame people for not knowing where to get it from or who to trust because so quickly on there's so much misinformation that floods out trying to sort through that. And when you have people you trust, um, like community members you trust, or, you know, whether it's, you know, a politician, a celebrity, a, you know, a sports person, you know, we all have different levels of trust in people. And when they don't know where to get the right information from and they're saying the wrong information early on, it just cascades into no one, really no one what to do. Yeah. And, and with things like a volcanic eruption, there are similarities with a pandemic and that you have to act before it feels like you need to. Um, you know, to a volcanologist looking at an, a volcano which is primed to go, you know, we're looking at all the different signals, the earthquakes, the gas, the, the land can sometimes even deform um, usually you can't see it, sometimes you can. Looking at heat signatures, we can see all of this with the technology and the expertise that we have. But if anyone else was looking at the volcano or the mountain, they'd been thinking, wow, it looks totally peaceful. What are you talking about? Right. So those people have to trust us, um, know that we, are, we have the best intentions of helping people with everything we can throw at this thing. And we know something bad is coming. Yeah, um, it's the same similar thing with this pandemic. You know, we had to act before it felt like we needed to, because right. once it once it felt like we needed to, it was too late. So, again, so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, with regards to things like figuring out who to trust in those situations, how do we know? Like. Personally, I'm one of those people that I'm super cynical and I like to watch different different um, trusted sources, but I also like, um, you know, sniff, sniff the money trail, who's funding the research, right? Um, but being, you know, being a close friend of yours for, you know, 13 years um, and then having other scientific friends in the DC metro area, um, you know, specifically because like NASA is here and all that sort of thing. It's amazing how many people still think that NASA is full of shit. So <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, so it's just, I, I guess, how do you, how do you feedback? Like what's your, what's your sifter? Um, it's really, you know, looking at, looking, uh, I mean, social media is a brilliant tool if you know how to use it. It can be a dangerous tool and a very unhelpful tool, but it can be brilliant. You know, looking at the scientists or mm -hmm. medical professionals, um, you know, I, watching some of the medical um, information coming out from doctors in New York City, that, that was a big eye-opener for me. Um, but looking at the scientists in that field, I mean, I didn't know any, any people in, in epidemiology at this time either. I was new to figuring this out. But looking at how the people within that field were interacting with each other um, and who was retweeting who and who was interacting with who and, and who was backing who up going, guys, we need to take this seriously. Um, and then, yeah, it was, it's hard. It's, it's, it's not easy. You know, if it's a volcano, um, I have one of the largest volcano accounts on social media. And like I said, it's only around 24,000. You know, it's yeah. really hard to find us, especially when you're looking through all the ports of misinformation. 
And there are people out there who are, you know, conspiracy theorists who have much bigger followings than we do. Um, you know, as, as trained scientists, we're trained to kind of stay in the background. We're trained to be really careful with what we say because we want to be accurate. And in these times where everything is uncertain, even to us, as, as, as situations are developing and we don't know where it's going to go because we don't have all the information, it can be incredibly difficult. Whereas you could have headlines that are screaming out, you know, big, statements and you know we don't have that equivalent when um you know when scientists are screaming something's really bad it's really really bad right but then you get by people that like again i'm not I, I totally agree with what you're saying do not get me wrong but when you get pseudoscientists who get paid to say whatever again how do you like we all know fauci is the bomb.com but <laughs> You know, there are other scientists who are maybe not so authentic. So it's interesting. Um, there's this misconception out there that scientists get paid a lot of money to say things. Oh, okay. Tell me more. We don't. We don't. <laughs> um, so for me to become a scientist, and, and you know, I can't speak for everyone. Um, I'm speaking for myself and those that I know. Um, mm -hmm. I, it took me 10 years of university, three degrees. Um, I'm still in debt. And I don't even have, you know, paid leave at this point. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, doing a lot of these fields in science, you don't do it for the money. You do it because you love it or you want to help people. And, you know, there are, there are bad eggs in every, in every place, I'm sure. But, you know, it's, it's not why we're doing this. Um, yeah. You know, if, you're, if I'm studying these volcanoes, it's because I, I love, I want to understand them. And yeah. in understanding them, we understand what we don't know. And we're okay with that. You know, that, that's what science is. We're trying to better ourselves all the time. We're trying to better each other all the time. Um, right. And that keeps us honest in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, we hear these things like science is covering something up. Um, anyone, anyone that thinks that hasn't been to a scientific conference. Um, so scientific conferences where we all come from either around a region or a country or the planet. And we, we present our research in front of all the other scientists. And it's terrifying. Like, this is terrifying. Scientists have passed out doing this. Right. Because if, if you're saying something that doesn't quite mesh with someone, you know, you can get ripped to shreds. Mm -hmm. And so this is the, the peer review process. You know, we, we go to these conferences, we present our science to other researchers, we talk to other researchers about it, then we publish it in these uh, journals, which are then sent out to other people and out, like, other people in our field and they rip them apart and then we have to come back and it's this really it's this really painful and demoralizing process okay <laughs> um and there are more, a lot of parts of it really aren't fun um and that's what it takes to get our science out there and there's still bad science that gets out there and it's frustrating to no end especially those of us who are trying to communicate and actually help society by communicating this stuff but the vast majority of the time, you know, we're trying to do better. We're trying to figure things out. Um, a lot of us, you know, are trying to help people. I'm out there doing all of this communication work on top of my job because I believe in it. It's really important. Right. Um, but, you know, there's, I, I don't blame people for not understanding how this works. You know, a lot of it's been kind of behind a curtain. A lot of our research isn't available to people. It's behind a paywall. You can't even read the damn stuff. And it's frustrating to me too. Um, and, you know, we often speak in a language that isn't accessible to people without a PhD, and that's also frustrating. Right. Um, so it's, you know, it's a two-way street, and a lot of us see that, you know, we have to do better. As scientists, we have to do better. We have to go to where people are and answer the particular questions and the concerns that they have in accessible language in ways that matter to them. So it's, you know, it's not just people need to blindly listen to us. We need to prove ourselves. How do you prove yourself as the boss scientist you are? Have to listen. Um, Besides your all, awesome volcano gifts <laughs> that you use on Twitter, as man. <laughs> uh, you know, we've got to listen to what people need from us. Um, you know, if, if people are really concerned about something, we have to address that and listen. Listening is so important and compassion is so important. You know, when people are concerned about Yellowstone for the 500th time, I'm not sitting here going, oh, they're so stupid. I'm sitting here thinking, God, these poor people, like, this is horrible, and they shouldn't be going through this. You know, we've got to be patient. We can't expect people to have, 
even a tenth of the knowledge we have after 10 years of higher education in a particular topic. Um, you know, all of these things take time. Um, and also keeping in mind that like, you know, your 10 years of higher education in a particular topic doesn't necessarily translate into, you know, a lot of people understanding what that all means. Absolutely. You know, um, and I, I love how compassionate you are about, you know, making sure people do understand like the language you use on Twitter, the language that you're using in your interviews, it, it's very accessible, I think, yeah. to a lot of a lot of audiences. So. It's, yeah, it's awesome. It bugs the crap out of me when I hear people saying, you've got to dumb it down. No, you're not dumbing it down. You're translating it. You know, you can't, you can't be speaking Japanese and dumb it down into Russian. You've got to translate it. And you need to understand both languages to do that. You need to understand the science and all of the pitfalls and all of the different ifs and buts in order to get it into a language accessible to different groups. It's, yeah. It takes skill and it's hard, especially when you have a volcano that might be or is leading to a big eruption. And this is an evolving system changing between minute to minute, day to day. And what's what it's showing now doesn't mean it's going to do this in, in two days. So we're trying to get the best science and throw everything we have at it and understand that particular system in order mm. to give a forecast of, you know, there's a, there's a chance that we're going to see a large eruption in the next three days. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, we, we're not great yet at explaining what we do know and what we don't know and what science is going to tell us within those limitations. Um, in fact, we often actually focus too much on what we don't know and then we leave people thinking we don't know anything. <laughs> so, yeah, Interesting. It's, okay. it's a balancing act and we're not there yet. We have a lot more to learn and that's going to come from listening and taking feedback and seeing what people aren't understanding. And, you know, it's the same with me. Like when... This, when the coronavirus hit the US, I didn't know really anything about epidemiology. Or, you know, I, I knew the basics and viruses that we all learn in school, but that was it. You know, I've been learning along with everyone else. Yeah. And we've got to remember that. You know, we might we talk about you know, talking to the public. We're all the public outside yeah. of our own tiny area. So you know, it's, it's we've got to come from it. You know, from a position of compassion and patience and being open and. In, in, a, in a position of service, like not how can you understand what I want you to, but what, what do you need to understand from me and how can I help? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really key point that in any form of com communication, it's not a case of like, hey, Janine, I need you to, you know, I could say, oh, I, I love it when you, I don't know, cook steak which I would when never I say because I don't eat meat but sorry when I dress up as your biggest fan. yes I love it when you dress up as my biggest fan which you totally did an amazing rocking job of on Halloween I will forever treasure that evening but um, but um you know you know but that could mean some type of thing to you or you know that, that you could you could almost understand that as I don't like it when you don't do that or I need you to do that all the time, right? And I think the definition of me being a responsible human being is to make sure that I am saying, delivering that message in every way possible to really make sure that you're understanding the essence of what I'm trying to say, not that I'm trying to manipulate your thinking or your habits or your actions, right? I, I'm guessing, I don't know, I feel, I feel like that's kind of a, a real, uh, issue with media is that we are so focused on what we're trying to get across that we forget to focus on what are people actually getting from what we're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's always a two-way street. It, it always is. Um, and, you know, when you're in a field that, you know, has catastrophic disasters um, and that really impacts lives, you know, that groundwork has to be laid before people need it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tweet, you know, cute volcano gifts and cat gifts and I'll, I'll, I'll interact with people online and, you know, I'm, I'm working to earn that trust before people need it. Um, and yeah. usually, you know, it's interesting, you know, my following count skyrockets when there's something awful happening. Um, so it's, you know, I've, I've got to earn that. And I've got to keep earning that. You know, I can't earn people's trust and then destroy it. You know, I've always got to be striving to be better for everyone out there who needs it. I think everybody needs to do that, you know. We do, as human beings, you know, in every setting of life, we've got to keep 
you know, looking at how we can do better for it, for people that, you know, how can, how can we can how can we contribute better? Yeah. And you, you know, you don't figure it out one day and never try to do better again. It's always changing. Like when I decided I wanted to be a volcanologist, Twitter wasn't a thing. <laughs> I don't even think we had the internet. No, we definitely didn't have the internet at home at that point. So, you know, it's, it's keeping when up. When you were 13. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. That was that was two decades ago, over two decades ago. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I was just thinking about that the other day. Like, so I, I coach songwriting, and I've got a a seventeen year old student, um, and then you know, like we're talking about her struggles where she's writing songs and things. I'm like, well, isn't it great that you have the internet? Because back when I was started writing, starting to write music, you know, I wrote my first song when I was five. Um, but you know, at the internet, my family was very advanced for a Kiwi family. So we got the internet when I was, I think nine, eight or nine years old. But uh, yeah, I guess that's about the time that you would have gotten yours as well. Cause you're a couple of years older than me. Yeah, yes. Yeah, Isn't that funny? Yeah, it's like the science, we're always driving the science forward. Like we're always, you know, there are, there are multiple PhDs written on like the type of earthquakes under a volcano and then decades of research that follows that and you know every tiny bit of volcanoes and every time a tiny bit of technology that we use on volcanoes and every time any, even how we communicate even how we talk about volcanoes there is also always um international research driving the field forward to do better to better mm. understand these systems and we need to keep doing that when it comes to connecting with people too like we, we could have given up before you know we could have stopped it what was it Bebo that was before Facebook in New Zealand? I don't yeah. know if that was international. We could have, um, you know, so, well, I've mastered one. I'm not, I'm not going to master anything anymore. <laughs> I feel like we have gone back to Bebo, to be honest, because the amount of quizzes that have gone over uh, through Facebook recently, <laughs> as everyone's stuck at home, like, hi, the top 10 things that you like to brush your teeth with. I don't know. Like, Serotin, wow, okay. I don't, I don't know, I just made that up, but, you know. <laughs> Well, yeah. there's vinegar and sodium and you know uh, anyways um cool so how are you as you know, you know going into your seventh week of quarantine how are you doing um i'm actually pretty good so uh i'm an extrovert i'm like emma i'm a raging extrovert at the front door <laughs> really shock. Shock. I mean, um, scientists can be extroverts. No, I'm, 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 I'm actually there. There aren't a lot, of, from what I've seen, of you know, majorly extroverted scientists, which is probably why I like talking about volcanoes all the time. I'm like, you want to hear about volcanoes? Well, let me tell you about volcanoes. What do you want to know about volcanoes? Tell me what you know about volcanoes. Um, so uh, the second week, I started to go a bit stir crazy, not being around people. You know, that's how he energizes being around people. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got the idea to create these videos, volcano moments. Um, I just, like, the idea exploded into my head, and then within, I think, a couple hours, wait, I wait, wait. The volcano exploded? The, <laughs> I did that, doesn't I? You did. I did that. I, I appreciate it. Carry on, please. Carry on. <laughs> um, and with these videos, um, they're two to four minutes long. Some of them are a bit longer, um, where I'm talking to an expert and explaining some aspect of volcanology. And I take questions on Twitter as well, and I try and find experts who can talk about it so it's not just me it's it's finding someone else and shining a light on another person or researcher um mm -hmm. and putting them on youtube and twitter and you know they're, they're accessible for um a lot of ages they're non-technical so that uh, parents or caregivers and teachers can use them if they you know if they want to have something to get their kids to or if they want to learn themselves about volcanoes and they're also supposed to be something positive that comes up on social media every day so that gave me a really good positive focus. Um, and it kept me really, really busy. I actually went on basically an unpaid leave for a couple of weeks to just churn these out. <laughs> I just wanted to help. Like I just, I needed to help in some way. I needed to contribute and give something in some way. Okay. Um, and yeah, then things started getting hard again. Um, it was started becoming very, very difficult being away from my family during this. Um, I have a great support network here. I have a lot of incredible friends, but being away from my family was really, really hard. Um, watching how our country responded to the pandemic was um, incredible and I admire it and it made me miss home even more. And so 
coming up two weeks ago now, I decided that after 11 years, I'm going to move home to New Zealand. Amazing. And since then, I've been actually feeling really good. Um, you know, ups and downs with everything. But, you know, I'm focusing on, trying to focus on the positive, trying to focus on, you know, making sure I'm, I'm staying informed where I need to be and being extremely careful. But, yeah, just finding those good things to contribute a way to contribute and something to look forward to as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that's an interesting point though, like you're going home, which is awesome and I'm super, super pumped and super going to miss you, but that's okay. It's not about me, it's about you. <laughs> I'm very excited for you. Like 11 years is a long way to be away from home, but are you excited to go back to basically a land of volcanoes? <laughs> Well, like, a lot of people are quite surprised that America, like, the United States has a lot of volcanoes, a lot of volcanoes, not on this side, um, on the other side, this side did millions of years ago, but on, so, you know, there are volcanoes in Alaska and Hawaii, more people mm -hmm. know about those, but there are Was in Washington State and Oregon um, and California and Arizona and Idaho, so there's a lot of volcanism here, but um, I went home for Christmas. And I was really, I don't know, I just felt like New Zealand is, and there was so much I love about this country. And I love the people. And this country is in the States? Just, sorry? This country is in the States? Yes. This country. Yeah, okay. Um, but going home and being with my family and being with, you know, I love the land. You know, Kiwis, we have a lot of connection to the land in New Zealand. Um, I love the, seeing the Maori culture and hearing the Maori culture. I love um, the landscape, the diverse landscape, and the volcanoes, of course, are wonderful as well. But yeah, it's, yeah it's something just, I don't know, I relaxed more than I have in a very, very long time. And That's so awesome. I'm looking forward to all of that. And, and you know, I honestly, I had to let my guard down a bit um, with everyone being so friendly, and openly friendly in New Zealand. It was, you know, it took me a couple of days. I was like, what do you want from me? <laughs> No way! Yeah. Yeah. You've become that Americanized? Oh my goodness! Yeah, that was that was a, it. Actually, probably took around a week for me to be like, "Why am I so stressed?" And like, "Oh, it's you know, that had become That's abnormal." And it's funny because I've read about Americans going to New Zealand and having this like, "What do you want from me? Why are you trying to talk to me?" And then I realized I was doing the same thing. I was like, "Oh my god." <laughs> it's funny because I, I I definitely know that. I mean, I'm still that person that talks to everybody. Um, so am I. <laughs> right? And so it's amazing to me how many Americans or, you know, Spanish or whomever that I, whatever country I'm in, are like, what, who are, what, what do you want? <laughs> like, <laughs> there really is, is no other culture like, like New Zealand, that's for sure. That's yeah, fun. yeah, like when you, in New Zealand, you walk down the street and, you know, you're saying hi to everyone or you're smiling at people at the very least, even if you don't know them. And when you go into a shop, you know, the whoever's there will strike up a genuine conversation with you. And, you know, here a lot of times I walk into a stuff shop and I'll hear, hi, how are you? How are you? And I'm looking around and no one's even looking at me. It's like the thing to say, but there's no response expected. It's, you know, it's a fun party game that I like to play. Like I'll walk past somebody and be like, hey, how are you? And they're like, hey. And then they get like, hey, how are you? And they'll walk past and I'm like, and I'll stop and I'll look around and like, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. They're like, <laughs> I'm like, how are you? Are you good? Like, what, what's, what's going on? Like, hey, let, let's be human for a minute. You know, it's a really fun experiment. People don't know what the hell to think. <laughs> New Zealand is messing with Americans since ages ago. <laughs> that's funny um okay cool 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 so um of your experiences working abroad in australia and the states mm -hmm. um what are the things you're going to take home with you oh god i have so much um i'm taking him home with me and his sister actually <laughs> that's cool um my american kitties um Oh, so much. I've met so many incredible people and I've had so many amazing experiences. But I think the biggest thing I'm taking home is, is me, is a, is, a, is a better version of myself. Um, you know, I had a few American friends that were telling me before I moved to this country, you're going to get eaten alive if you don't toughen up. And they were right. I, I had to toughen up a lot. You know, I couldn't stand up for myself to save my life. And, you know, I've, having been through so much uncertainty, you know, you've, you've been here. I've, I've, 
face, nearly having to leave the country when my PhD ended, I've done, um, you know, I fell face first into communicating a crisis on the other side of the world. Um, I've dealt with some pretty harrowing experiences over the last few years, especially, and, mm. you know, also major health issues um, away from family. So, yeah, it's, I'm so much stronger than I was. And, you know, that's always been rooted in being strong and kind and strong and compassion and, and fearless in that as well, you know, doing something differently to help people can be terrifying at times. Um, but, you know, I've, I've got to know better what my strengths are and what my weaknesses are or the areas I need to work on. And I'll be taking that home. And I really hope I can contribute in a positive way to our country. That's cool. That's really cool. It's interesting that you uh, you got those messages of being able to harden up, being told to harden up. That's a really Kiwi <laughs> thing to say to people. Um, the messages that I got when I, when I was leaving uh, was either this might make you laugh, um, you'll be back or don't come back. <laughs> what? As in, don't come back to this country because you're destined for bigger things or, you know, America needs your, whatever it was. Like, um, it's, 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 I don't know, it's, it's interesting to me how, the two cultures can be very, very similar in a lot of ways. And I was prepared for it to be very similar. I was not prepared nearly enough for how different oh, the yeah. cultures were gonna be. Yeah. And it ended up being, especially when you travel from state to state. Because remember, you know, growing up in Raglan and, you know, the Waikato, um, Hamilton, then Auckland, which is the, like the second most multicultural city in, in Auckland, in, in New Zealand rather, and then, living for three months in the woods in, of Massachusetts and then another three months in the woods of Connecticut uh, before coming to what is referred to as Chocolate City, Washington, D.C. You didn't know that, that, right? No. You've not heard of it being called Chocolate City? No. Girl, <laughs> I was like, yo, what? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's been a, it's, it's almost like a social science experiment living here so I'm really curious as to how things are going to go for you once you move back yeah you know it's one of my concerns you know when I left I, I left to get international experience I left to learn more abroad you know in my mind growing up you know New Zealand was I mean I didn't I honestly I had no idea how small New Zealand was like we live on a freaking island are you aware of this like it's an <laughs> island where I live it's like an hour and a half to the beach either way um, but so much has changed in the last 11 years. Like New Zealand is, you know, the, one of the last uh, conferences I went to, I went to a volcano conference in Italy. And this conference is all about um, the area of science where volcanoes and people connect. Um, so how do we help people? How do we communicate? How do we better ourselves as scientists to help people kind of thing? And I heard so many times from people, wow, New Zealand's like really ahead of the game. They're, they're world leaders and those kind of comments. And, you know, going back this last Christmas, I hadn't been home for nearly four years. And you see so many people in New Zealand are doing incredible things. And it doesn't have to be huge. Like a friend of, two friends of mine started up um, this thing where they're, they're taking food to kids. And like so many people doing that. And there's this real attitude in New Zealand of like Kiwi ingenuity, we call it, like doing things differently. Yeah. And, doing better with what we have and then you see you know so much great stuff has come out of New Zealand like look at Peter Jackson with Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and and more and you know we have Lord the musician that have that come out you know you don't have to be in a big don't forget Flight of the Concords <laughs> I love Flight of the Concords um and Taika Waititi like so many amazing people doing amazing things you don't have to be in a big place to do big things if that bigger place is better for you go for it but you know we're not as limited anymore you know it's easier to travel we have the internet it's yeah you can do big things anywhere it's just what's right for you as an individual totally totally you're phenomenal i'm i'm so privileged to call you a friend and i i'm so excited for this next chapter of your life 
um, once the quarantine is over and we're able to travel again. Um, be speaking of which, arrives. my passport arrives in like the next three weeks. So I, uh, you know, can come and visit you once you move back, which is exciting. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything that you want to say as like last words for those who are either interested in volcanology or science or, you know, that are just struggling right now that um, during this pandemic um, to kind of help bring some love to the world? Yeah, so something I've learned in the last 10 years is, you know, out of my biggest struggles and there have been some really, really, really big ones. Um, you know, that's where my biggest strength has really come from. I don't think you have to go through struggle to be stronger or to better yourself. But, you know, if you keep in mind where you want to go and who you want to be, you know, do you want to be that kind and compassion and open person? Do you want to be strong? Do you want to be funny? Do you want to uplift people? Like, what do you want to be? And who do you want to who do you want to be? What do you want to bring to the world? Keep that in mind and keep reaching for that. Um, you know, this is a really hard time for a lot of people. I know people have lost parents through this uh, pandemic so far, and there's going to be more. But there's so much good. There's so much good in the world. And every single one of you has the power to make a difference in people's lives. We all have the internet. We all have our voices. We can all contribute something really good to the world right now. And now is a great time to step up and be creative with that just do some good preach step out sounds like a good name for a song i've been writing my butt off since this pandemic hit so yeah love. i've been what did you say you've been writing a song called butt love no i've been writing my butt off oh <laughs> <laughs> i'm thinking about new zealand i'm already i'm already like losing your accent in my mind i love it that's hilarious <laughs> um no thank you so much dr janine kripner um, you're phenomenal. Thank you so much for being here, speaking to me, um, for being patient with these technical difficulties. <laughs> hey, we can cross it up on, on this pandemic thing. Go. Technical difficulties for nearly an hour. <laughs> I love it. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.